Uh, today is going to be the first panel I've done. Um, part of what's going on is my long-term interests and especially recent events in my life, meaning losing my job during a massive layoff, have gotten me thinking a lot more about a certain topic than I usually do. That topic is the topic of labor and labor organizing, and in this case, international labor organizing. <clears throat> so on this effort, I have brought back two guests who have been here before, along with a third guest that we are all excited to meet. Uh, speaking to things more familiar to those of us in the United States, David Van Dusen, former president of the Vermont AFL-CIO, has joined us and will help to get things going. Next, Rene Berthier, CGT member and anarcho-syndicalist, will be discussing some things more specific to the context in France. And finally, our new guest, Anna, from the Emergency Committee for Rojava, will give us some insights into the situation in Northeast Syria and the unionization efforts ongoing there. So I'm going to go ahead and put David up on the screen here in focus. And uh, yeah, so um, David, I know you've been on the show before and we were talking about some of these things then. Um, at the time, you were the current president of the Vermont AFL-CIO. And now you uh, have given the chair over to, um, who is president right now? E.D. Harris Maurice from our United Slate. Uh, won her contested election in September of this past year. Okay, and uh, so the United Slate is something that you know I'm very excited about, and uh, you've I've seen a number of like ten points and uh, different parts of the program that have come out that are very similar to a, a more directly democratic or syndicalist way of unionizing, which is not very common in the United States. And I guess the first, you know, line of questions I wanted to talk to you about is uh, what exactly is the 10 point uh, United Slate and how does that fit into or change the way unionization has been done here roughly since the 1930s or whenever the IWW kind of fell off the map? Sure. Our 10 point program, also known as the Little Green Book, it came out of our 2019 uh, rise, our election, our election efforts to change the way we do union business, the way we do union organizing here in Vermont. As a starting point, we realized early on by 2017 that our labor federation, the largest in Vermont, was essentially dying. Rank and file union members had no real connection to our state labor council. Participation was falling. Uh, no resources or little resources were being put to organizing. Uh, the resources we did have were going into backing bad political candidates, largely from the Democratic Party, and not seeing anything in return uh, from those efforts at the State House. So uh, in 2019, we formed a broad coalition ranging from the building trades to public sector workers to uh, uh, everybody you could possibly imagine, including university workers. And we successfully swept elections. Since then, we've won four elections in a row, running on our 10-point program, which is now the program, the agenda, the platform of the Vermont AFL-CIO. Now, we saw with clear eyes that if we are going to ask people to get active, if we are going to ask workers to stand up and fight for their collective interests, if we are going to build a working class movement capable of not just winning a minor gain here and there, but of building towards foundational change in society, then it was important and it remains important that we walk the talk. And that means for us democratizing uh, the State Labor Council. That means building rank and file power. That means taking power out of centralized committees and putting them back with the workers where they belong and engaging workers at the shop floor at every level 
to make sure they know that their interests, their, their dreams, their desires, their concerns are truly reflected in the labor organization that they are part of. Uh, I'm happy to report that, that that did strike a chord with our members. And after we won those elections, we did not just stop there. We changed our constitution to allow more participation of rank and file in all the bodies uh, where decisions are made. We opened up our leadership meetings to all members who choose to participate, choose to have a voice, and choose to know uh, what the direction should be or express what the direction should be of our labor movement. Uh, we also doubled the amount of delegates afforded to our locals, our affiliated locals, uh, to send to our conventions to, again, increase rank and file uh, voice in, in our labor bodies. But that's not all we did. We also recognize that real power, real union power, working class power does not start and stop in parliaments or general uh, or general assemblies or government bodies. Uh, we recognize that our real power is our solidarity. Our real power is in the factories, on the streets, in the communities. And as part of that, we actually took United, once in power, took resources out of lobbying, took resources out of our elections and put them into developing, first time ever, an organizing department that actually sends real resources, real organizers, real know-how to our affiliated locals when they are looking for solidarity, when they are looking for help unionizing more shops. And we've been successful there. In Vermont, unlike all, almost all, not all, but most of the other 49 states in, in this country, we are consistently growing. When we took power in 2019, we had 10,000 AFL-CIO members in the state of Vermont. Today, we have 20,000, 20,000. So we are growing and we are setting an example across the country for what union power could be like if our labor federations, if the national AFL-CIO, if uh, our current crop of leaders or the new leaders we elect come to understand that we need a fundamental refocus of our labor organizing efforts. We need to move away from a democratic party, a capitalist party, which does not represent the interests of workers. We need to move towards our own uh, collective power. We need to build it from the bottom up. We need to be unafraid of strikes. We need to be willing and able to take action and mobilize our membership in order to truly challenge the status quo. And, and that is not easy. That is hard. There are challenges that come with that. There are orthodoxies that must be broken, and there is always going to be some uncomfortableness in that kind of effort. But we know this. From the 1950s in the United States of America to the present day, our union density has, in fact, declined. Our power has weakened, not gotten stronger. And every time we hitch our, our, our wagon to, to the capitalist parties, every time we buy into the premise that only the two major parties, Republican, Democrat, represent the full spectrum of what politics should be or can be. When we do that, we get weaker. And we know that we cannot keep going down the path that leads to weakness. We have to radically change what we do. We have to learn lessons from across the world. We have to build solidarity across the world and in the local communities with working class people to amplify our power and to change what is political politically possible in the Green Mountains of Vermont and beyond. And as part of that, we are proud to have, as United, as the Vermont AFL-CIO, to reach our hand out in solidarity with organizations of working people across the world, including the unions in Rojava, which we strongly support, and which we have uh, had the honor of having a, two uh, joint meetings with over the last couple of years to learn about each other's struggle. And we also raise our fist to the French workers who are unafraid to go on strike, who are unafraid to shut down cities, to do what is necessary to fight back against attacks against the working class in France. But we also know that nowhere in the world have we definitively won. We know that the struggle to really change the world is going to have to be international because capital is international. And we must experiment we must build that international solidarity, and we need to articulate what a better world will actually look like, what actually feel like, and that needs to be a reflection of the workers we actually represent. These changes that we have made here in Vermont is an example to the rest of the country, and we're not done yet. 
even though I'm not president of Romani Felciao, United has a firm majority of our elected executive board winning our fourth election. Um, president Katie Harris Maurice is from our United Slate, our progressive left wing working class United Slate, as well as executive vice president Ellen Kay. So while we have a long road, I look forward to this discussion today, learning about more about the struggles in, in France, uh, where they're unafraid to strike, learning more about the struggles uh, in Rojava and how the unions are helping to craft a more directly democratic participatory democracy uh, in that corner of the Middle East. So with that said, solidarity, and it's great to be here. Solidarity. Um, so you did mention some of the orthodoxies that are a hurdle to creating a more directly democratic union structure. And I'm wondering if you could just elaborate on what those orthodoxies are and where they came from um, in, in the United States, because clearly in France, there's different uh, different traditions as far as union organizing goes that that point uh, France in a different direction than here and probably the same elsewhere in the world, so. Sure. Well, in the United States, the largest labor body uh, is one that I'm a member of, the AFL-CIO. With 12.5 million members, it is by far the largest working class organization in the United States of America. It comes out of a, a long history measured in some ways, you could say 100 years, but its internal systems, its so-called democratic processes, frankly, are archaic, Byzantium at best, uh, where we, we, and I say this in a larger way, uh, will say that this is a democratic worker organization. The truth be told, it is not. In the last election for the national AFL-CIO leadership, uh, 500, give or take, delegates, largely appointed, from uh, affiliated unions across across the country, 500 delegates uh, representing 12.5 million people elected the current leadership. Those are archaic old bylaws. That's a constitution that is undemocratic and needs to be radically changed. The Vermont AFL-CIO sent two resolutions uh, to the last uh, convention in Philadelphia. Uh, those resolutions, one of them was to prepare for a general strike in the event of another right-wing coup attempt uh, in, in the next presidential election. But the other one that's pertinent to our, our discussion right at this moment was to create one member, one vote, to elect the new leadership. Because we feel that if we cannot, as a labor organization, truly represent the views of the 12 point five million members, and we can't expect them to be radically uh, engaged if they don't have a sense of ownership with, over the organization. So we want to democratize the National AFL-CIO. We want one member, one vote. It's no surprise in the UAW that when they went to one member, vote, one vote for the last election, a progressive working class left leadership was elected directly by the members. That would never have happened under their previous uh, old anti-democratic uh, way of choosing leaders through a delegate system. So ironically, the National AFL-CIO leadership chose not to allow our resolutions to be debated and voted on at the floor. But myself and, and another AFL-CIO leader from, from uh, comes out of United, our executive director, Liz Medina, were able to use that denial from the floor to talk about issues of democracy, to highlight how we need to become more democratic. And we had wonderful, uh, pop, uh, great conversations with leaders from across the country, from uh, Alaska to Wyoming, and, and all points from east to west about how something is different, how something can be different, must be different, and must be changed over a period of time. This is not a short struggle. This is a long struggle. But again, if we're ever going to get to the point where workers are going to heed our call, should we make the call to go to the barricades, to throw down their tools, to stop work? They're not going to do this unless they have a sense that they own the labor organization, which is making the call. And they're not going to have a sense of ownership unless they are directly uh, empowered to democratically uh, affect the decisions and the priorities of 
the AFL-CIO. So democratizing from within, being at the state level, which we've done a, a very strong job of here in Vermont, to doing it on the national level. That is one of the challenges before us in the coming decade. And I look forward to continuing to be part of that fight from the working class left within the labor movement. So just to ask you one more question before we move on to Renee, um, I know you mentioned that you have been doing work with the Rojava uh, Emergency Coordinating Committee. Uh, what are some of the other international projects that, um, that you've been engaged in? Well, in 2021, we were proud to vote to stand in solidarity with uh, Labor for Palestine. Uh, that's something that I, I think is, is absolutely important for all labor organizations uh, to take a stand on. The ethnic cleansing, frankly, that we see going on in Gaza today is a historic, moral, and uh, political tr uh, tragedy. It's worse than that. It is mass murder on a scale that we have not seen in, in, in generations. Uh, so standing up for the Palestinian workers, Palestinian people is something that, that of course, uh, we, have, we have consistently expressed in a public way. But also standing with Rojava, we don't do this just because um, they defeated ISIS or drove out ISIS from the country. We do this because what they're seeking to build in, in that corner of the Middle East, that part of Syria, is a directly democratic society. Not since 1936 in Spain, in the uprising against the, the fascist coup, have, in my opinion, have we seen such a far-reaching revolution take form and seize large areas, uh, liberated large areas, to experiment and to try to build a new type of society, one that has never in a modern industrialized sense uh, seen uh, come to fruition. If this was Europe, if this was North America, the fight in Rojava today would be, go would be front page news of every newspaper every day. Uh, it's unfortunate that much of the mainstream media seems to take a disinterest in the struggle after ISIS was largely driven out of the region. Uh, so this, to me, needs to be a huge, if not the, international priority for the labor movement, not just in the United States or France, but in every corner of the globe. Because if we could win and break the chains of authoritarianism, oppression, capitalism uh, in Rojava, then we will be able to show that we could do it everywhere. And this will be, could be a spark that, that helps us to realize a new, more liberated world. Excellent, thank you very much. I'm gonna bring Renee on the screen. Uh, welcome back to the show. How, uh, so uh, we talked a little bit about how you were a member with the CGT last time we spoke, but I know we didn't focus on that a lot. And um, I'm not sure how many people in the audience are from France or know anything about the CGT. So I was hoping you could give a little background about the CGT in general and some of its syndicalist uh, origins and ongoing uh, structure today. Well, first, I'd like to say that what what, I, what David said was absolutely uh, 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 incredible, uh, in, uh, very impressive, uh, uh, the, the struggle he's been leading. And I, I, I wanted to say that. Concerning France, the, 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 the French Confederation CGT, uh, which means General Confederation of Labour, uh, used to be uh, syndicalist. Or, or, or in French we say revolutionary syndicalist, but uh, for a long time it hasn't been so. In, in the late 20s and uh, early 30s it was taken over by the communists, and uh, it remains so until quite recently. Uh, so uh, when I joined the, CG, the CGT, uh, I was, uh, I don't know, 25, uh, I was already a, a, an anarcho-syndicalist, uh, and and uh, it was a period of overwhelming communist control over the this organization. And I, I've been 
uh, sort of uh, living with the communists for many years, so I know them very well. Uh, fortunately, the, the union which uh, I joined was not controlled by the communists. It, was, it had a very long anarcho-syndicalist tradition, and the communists uh, uh, never were able to uh, uh, take control of it because uh, the, the elder comrades, the, the, my union was created in 1886, and uh, there had been uh, measures taken to avoid taking, uh, the, to taking control of the organization by, uh, by external fractions. So uh, I, I retired in 2003, so I uh, stopped uh, having any, anything to do with the union except with the, uh, the retired uh, comrades. But it, um, the, 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 the French CGT today has nothing to do with, uh, with syndicalism, except in very, uh, very uh, limited sectors of, uh, of production. Uh, Dockers, for instance. Uh, well, the, the, the main problem today in, in France, in the, in the labor movement, is that for 20 or 30 years, we are in a, a defensive position. Uh, when, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we thought that there would be an opportunity for the revolutionary movement to, to rise again, but it was not the case. Uh, the, the, the anarchists and the other uh, left-wing uh, uh, parties were not able to take over anything. Uh, it was the, the, the collapse of communism was also in a, uh, well, it might shock uh, American uh, people, but the collapse, the general collapse of communism was also a collapse of the uh, labor movement because uh, uh, the communist parties, uh, well, it's the anarchists who says that, might be strange. The, the, the communist parties were a sort of a, uh, uh, the last barricade against uh, capitalist offensive. Uh, the, the CGT was uh, the overwhelming uh, major uh, union uh, organization in France, and it was then uh, able, uh, before, before the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union and the collapse, the general collapse of communism, it was still able to uh, defend the workers uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a lot, in, in a certain way. I mean, not, it wasn't something, uh, it, it was partial, but it was effective. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, uh, this, it might seem paradoxical. Uh, the collapse of uh, uh, the communist parties in Europe, in France in particular, uh, was not uh, compensated, unfortunately, by the rise of a revolutionary movement, except perhaps in, in Spain in, in a certain way. Uh, but in, in France, it was absolutely not the case. And today, the the, the, Trotskyist, the, the, the Trotskyist movement is divided into I don't, I don't know how many parties, and who, uh, in fact, uh, became left-wing social democratic parties. They spend their time preparing elections, and uh, they exhaust themselves in uh, preparing an election when another one is lost. You know? And uh, they, they don't propose anything uh, 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 interesting to the workers in, in, in uh, uh, concerning uh, the project. You know, uh, there's something Kropotkin said, which I, I think is uh, uh, absolutely incredible. He said, uh, uh, in, insurrections are provoked by anger, but revolution is provoked by hope, and uh, unfortunately, in the in the French working class, there is no hope, because the the, uh, the neoliberal uh, politics have literally smashed any hope in, in among among the working people. And I, I said we we were in a defensive position uh, in 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 all ways concerning uh, healthcare concerning. Uh, Health, uh, 
the retirement pensions concerning everything, transports you know, concerning, and everything, in fact, well, is is done as if uh, the American model was to dominate. We we have the impression that what will finally uh, win is the American model. That is, you can fire people whenever you want. Well, it's not it's not the case now, but is it seems that it's going to be so. That when when you go to hospital and you don't have money, you get kicked out, which is still not the case today. But we have the impression it is going to be that uh, within uh, five, ten, or twenty years. In, in uh, <laughs> uh, ten years ago, I had cancer. And I, I was operated in a in a military hospital, which which was quite funny for an anarchist. And I didn't pay anything. I, I paid eight euros seventy eight. I, I never understood what th this eight, these eight euros corresponded to, but probably the telephone. In France, when you have cancer, diabetes, uh, uh, hypertension, and, and a certain number of diseases. It's, take, it's taken care of, but by the healthcare uh, system, and you don't pay. It doesn't mean that you don't pay anything because we subscribe to uh, the healthcare system, but the, the system is made in such a way that the, 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 the funding of the healthcare system is made 60% by the bosses and 40% by the workers. On my payroll, uh, I have. Uh, Contribution to the healthcare system and to the pension and so on, uh, uh, but the, the 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 employers also pay sixty uh, percent of the total. So this is how it works. Uh, until now, it works quite not so bad. I mean, it's uh, uh, but more and more uh, when you go to a public hospital, you wait hours, sometimes even days before getting uh, find, uh, having a doctor if you go to a private hospital you're taken care of almost immediately and this is what is going to, to i think this is what the people who decide wanted to be to oblige people to go to private system and 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 forget the public system and and that's uh well it's uh, what i'm trying to to say is that it's, it seems that the, the, the future of uh, all, the, all the things for which the workers have fought for, 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 for more than us a century will be uh, smashed. And, uh, well, uh, when there, were, there were great demonstrations. Well, maybe from, from the United States, you have the impression that the French workers fight often to defend their... their, 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 their the things for which they have fought, but they fight in a defensive way, which what seems good to me is they still still fight, but for how long? I mean. So a couple of other questions. Um, one is what is the the internal structure of uh, the CGT like now? Is it one person, one vote, the way that David was discussing the United uh, slate no, pushing uh, for? No, um, no, it's, it's uh, there's a sort of, uh, uh, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it in English. You, you've got big unions. Uh, you need a uh, in some unions, you need more votes to have one delegate. You, you, you need a, uh, in some unions, you, ne you need a 1,000 uh, members to have one delegate at the Congress. In, in other unions, you need more or less. Depends on the, con on the context. Okay. And then as far as the international question goes, uh, I imagine there is still some communication with the CNT in Spain, what what is in general? What does the international labor scene look like coming out of the French context? Well, from, from the French anarchist movement, I mean, sure. Uh, 
Well, the, the, the Spanish situation is very complicated, and I admit I, I don't understand uh, it very well. I mean, there, there are several CNTs. Uh, at the beginning, uh, when when Franco uh, died, there was a uh, the CNT uh, re reorganized in a, a very impressive way. But uh, in the in the exile. Uh, I think most of the Spanish anarchists who were exiled in France, and there was a struggle between two tendencies. One tendency which represented the leaders in exile, and one tendency representing uh, the uh, militants who still kept struggling inside Spain. And the exile uh, leaders uh, intended to keep the leading the leadership of the organization and the militants fighting inside for a long time uh, said that the direction of the movement will uh, be uh, held by those who fight inside and uh, the first uh, free congress of the cnt in spain will be the congress which will decide the leadership of the cnt then there was another problem uh, there are uh, what we call comité d'entreprise, uh, workplace committees, which uh, elect delegates, uh, which uh, uh, sit with uh, in in parity with with the bosses to organize different things inside inside the the, the workplace, and this is considered by uh, the radical. Uh, uh, fraction of the uh, anarcho-syndicalist movement as collaboration, which strictly speaking is not, couldn't really be considered as a collaboration because there are these work, these places, these committees are the places uh, where very strong oppositions appear. Uh, so the, the, the anarchist movement in Spain was uh, uh, divided between those who said we must we must accept the idea of having uh, uh, shop stewards elected by the workers in the in the in the, in the workplace, and uh, and and others who said we 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 should not. And I think, well, this is a personal opinion. I think this is where the uh, the split began within the Spanish movement. So. Uh, uh, this is why, uh, uh, after the reconstitution of the CNT in Spain, there was a split which created the CGT. Well, in my opinion, the CGT, uh, what they wanted was to adapt themselves to the evolution of society, the society of uh, uh, 1970, 1980, or two, uh, 2000 is not the same as 1936. So you have to adapt to uh, to that to uh, to the new situation. Well, this is my opinion. The the other part, the more radical uh, militants, consider that they should not accept this evolution. All right. So uh, I'm sure there will be more to talk about when we move into the open discussion. Uh, right. I'm going to turn over to Anna right now, so we could talk about the situation in Rojava. Uh, hi, Anna. Hi. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, th I nope. assume... Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, yeah, perfect. Fine. Yeah, I assume your audience is familiar more or less with Rojava, but maybe I can go over just the basic developments that are taking place. Yeah. Or... Cool. You right. know, I would... I don't know how familiar okay. they really are with it, so probably a general overview would, would help a lot. Okay, great. So Rojava is a de facto autonomous entity that emerged out of the Syrian civil war in 2011 in northeast Syria. In fact, the official name of this autonomous region is the Democratic Autonomous Administration of Northeast Syria. And it emerged initially in the Kurdish majority area. So there was the Kurdish freedom movement that had been organizing for a couple of decades before the civil war broke out in Syria. And 
um, because of the war conditions, there was political vacuum that the Kurdish movement, because it was so well organized, because it had uh, armed structures, it was able to take advantage of. And so they also had a very radical uh, leftist vision that was developed by the imprisoned Kurdish leader Abdullah Ocalan uh, called democratic confederalism. So they sort of um, saw an opportunity um, under the worst conditions, really, that you can imagine for a revolution to put into practice um, a radical um, philosophy of social transformation that's based on the principles of direct democracy. David mentioned that um, women's freedom, um, ecological sustainability, democratized economy, and pluralism, which is, again, super important for the Middle East, um, particularly today. And um, you know, the way it has you know, looked in practice, they have set up um, a directly democratic system that is based um, in communes. Communes are village or um, neighborhood-based assemblies where people come together to discuss you know, whatever issues concern their lives. And these communes federate further into higher territorial levels um, you know, to the level of um, a district, a city district, to the city level, to the regional level, to the inter-regional level, so forth. And now, uh, since they defeated ISIS, so to defeat ISIS, that was the main threat um, for a few years. That's when the movement became uh, world famous. Um, to, to, in order to defeat ISIS, they had to collaborate with um, other ethno-religious groups in the regions, including Arabs, Armenians, uh, Syriacs, Assyrians, etc. And now they have enlarged uh, the territory under their control to also include Arab majority regions. So as I mentioned, it started out more in a Kurdish majority area. Now it's no longer just a Kurdish project. project. Uh, they're trying to uh, incorporate all the groups um, that are local to this region. They try to ensure that all of them have the same access to power. And it's quite difficult to do that in that region uh, because uh, just like in other parts of the Middle East, because of imperialism, because of the nation state system that was imposed um, on the region, um, in particular after the breakdown of the Ottoman Empire, after the First World War. So a lot of these groups have been pitted against each other, like Kurds have been pitted against Arabs or against Armenians um, or utilized uh, against each other by imperialist, by imperial or nation state powers. And so it's um, you know, sort of a, a ray of hope, really, uh, that uh, these different groups now are able to come together and to be part of the same government and you know, explicitly trying to build a government where everyone has the same rights and um, live where everyone lives in peaceful coexistence. And uh, they've also tried to democratize the economy, right? So this is more relevant for our discussion today. The main idea in terms of how to go about this is to encourage, to build up a cooperative sector. So the autonomous administration, which is like the government, you can say that was set up by the revolutionary movement, but is now, you know, incorporates all the sectors of the society. Some of them are not super revolutionary, but, you know, it's a democratic project. Um, so that's one of the contradictions. But in any case, um, they have been trying to encourage people to open up um, worker or consumer cooperatives. And um, I can talk about that a little bit later. Um, they're not against private property per se, you know, that comes as a surprise to some of the leftists. Um, they want to eliminate monopolies uh, in the long term and promote, as I said, cooperatives alongside small um, ownership enterprises. And at the same time, you know, this is like the main thrust um, of their uh, work on the economic front. But at the same time, they have been um, organizing unions, both in private and public sectors, with, um, we can say, with two objectives. One is, you know, very basic level to ensure that workers um, workers' rights are secured and protected. And this is, you know, it's doesn't sound too radical, but it's rather radical in this context. Uh, you know, we can talk about orthodoxies of uh, labor, of unions in the Syrian um, context. Uh, 
before the revolution under the Ba'ath regime, under two Assad regimes, there was no real independent union organizing. Um, there were worker and farmer associations established by the Ba'ath regime and they had to do uh, the regime's bidding. They were not able to organize independently. They you know, basically served the interests of the state rather than the workers. So the fact that the autonomous administration um, puts priority to organizing workers and um, building up unions is um, very important in this regard. But the other objective, now, and, and this is an interesting thing too, you know, the unions are being fostered by the autonomous administration, by the movement, and at the same time, you know, that they want the public employees to you know, express their grievances or if necessary go on strike against the autonomous administration itself. So it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon when the same movement sets up you know, a kind of a dual power situation. Um, and the other objective um, one can say is, and they explicitly say that the union organizers there is to use unions as a mobilizing tool to reach broader sectors of um, Rojava's population for the purposes of the broader um, project of social transformation. So they want to radicalize people. They want they use unions to develop people's consciousness, to develop people's skills at organizing, at self-organization, develop their skills in civic participation. You know, large majority of the local population uh, was never political before the revolution started because they were not able to do so. Um, it was um, in, an independent political activity, union or otherwise, was criminalized um, by the Assad regime. So, you know, um, and I believe, I imagine this is somehow different to what David and um, his colleagues have been doing in Vermont, right? Um, not considering unions um, just um, as tools to... Um, uh, secure workers' rights, but also to enact broader social change. Now, maybe one last thing that I can tell about the unions before we move on to other questions is that they are incorporated into, formally incorporated into the new political system that was set up um, by the revolutionary movement. I know David mentioned that in their work, they decided to break away from political parties. In Rojava, it's a different context. They actually want the unions to be um, represented in the political system, but you know, in their own right, um, autonomously. So, um, you know, they have representation. They have quotas uh, alongside the communes and the cooperatives and other civil society institutions and political parties. There are political parties there still, and in fact. You know, if any any person, any regular person, can be involved in politics, broadly speaking, through multiple means, right? If let's say, let's take for example a teacher, you know, they would by default be part of their commune, so they would be going to commune meetings, you know, probably involved in the commune's education committee, you know, by virtue of being a teacher. And at the same time, they can organize actively through their teachers' union. And if it's a woman, um, they are by default part of the women's autonomous body, um, bodies that exist at all levels of organizing, um, affiliated with the autonomous administration, with the movement. So there is a women's committee as part of the commune. There is a women's autonomous committee as part of a union, any union really any institution and those women's autonomous committees, they have veto power over any decisions that affect women's rights that are taken by the sort of general body of that organization or institution um, if they feel like that decision uh, harms women's rights. And let's say if this teacher is um, Syriac, um, if um, she comes from a um, certain um, ethno-religious background, if she belongs to an ethno-religious minority, then she can also participate through a autonomous, um, you know, let's say Syriac political party that also um, has, it has guaranteed representation in the political system, you know, through various um, quota mechanisms and uh, co-chair mechanisms. And co-chair is another exciting uh, mechanism that they have uh, introduced where in every leadership position you have one woman and one man, and they usually try to make these two um, chairs uh, 
come from different ethno-religious backgrounds. So let's say um, a woman may be Kurdish and a man may be Arab. And yeah, so they try to um, um, tie together these different ways of organizing, different ways of representing people's uh, interests in their, you know, in whatever roles those people occupy in their in the society. Thank you very much for the overview. I know it's a. Uh... It's such a different situation than anything that we know in the United States or even in France. So there's so much to go over and to just focus on unions without touching on that, you know, isn't really uh, giving much of a picture of what's happening there. But um, one thing I would like to have you help clarify is the way that things unfolded in Rojava wasn't the way that leftists usually think, you know, you have the unions that, uh, you know, in the industrial sectors that will expropriate or take over their workplaces. And then you have the collectivization and, you know, ownership of the land handed over to the people who work the land. And I know in Rojavit, these things happen a bit differently. And we, there's this uh, ongoing effort to create these cooperatives, but private property wasn't ever outlawed. It wasn't ever uh, abolished. Um, and then as far as the unions go, there is still, therefore, a need for the unions to be uh, acting uh, progressively to bring more democratic structures into the workplaces that people are working in. So if you could talk a little bit more about that and sort of what the projects are that the unions there are taking on to move those efforts forward, I think uh, we could then turn after that, go into more of a open group discussion. Cool. Yes. So they just have a different vision in terms of democratizing economy and a different um, strategic approach you know, given the circumstances under which the movement finds itself. And so the global left has to um, have, you know, under, have some understanding for that and um, accept, be tolerant of uh, nuances and contradictions. But um, I think it's, yeah, it's very important to emphasize that, you know, first of all, the philosophy, the vision is a bit different, right? They, as I said, are not opposed to private property. They're opposed to monopolies, right? They're opposed um, to big businesses. Um, they're opposed to um, enterprises uh, that abuse um, um, workers' rights. So, you know, they envision uh, being able to um, introduce regulations to minimize, uh, to eliminate ultimately um, this type of um, um, this type of economic organization and the abuses that it um, produces. And um, of course, in practice, they have lagged behind significantly for a variety of reasons, but the really the main thrust of um, organizing on this front is to encourage people to set up their own um, cooperatives. And that's, that's the main way how they envision democratizing workplace. And it's the movement is very intentional about that. They have like a cooperatives network that um, you know actively encourages people, talks to people, goes out to communes to to educate people on what cooperatives are. I have to admit that a lot of people don't even know what what this form of economic organizing is. And um, every cooperative that has been created since the revolution is part of this network. They have to um, give 5% of their annual profit to the network to support establishing more cooperatives. Um, there is also support, financial support. You mentioned you know, collectivization of land. Um, what's specific to the region is that the Syrian government, the Assad regime, was the main landowner before the revolution. So in fact, once the regime withdrew its forces, once the movement um, took control of the area, they took over the land and they have designated um, part of this land. I mean, part of this used um, you know, this public, public land for public production of wheat in particular. 
Um, but um, a good amount, a good chunk of this land has been designated uh, for the use specifically by cooperatives. So people who decide to open a cooperative can come and apply and get the land, you know, perhaps for several years, they want to rotate, they want to make sure that a lot of people have access to this, they give priority to the poor, to the landless, and there are other, there are other incentive, incentives and um, um, ways to support the people who decide to try this out. And it's been challenging, um, and that's why they have really succeeded in expanding the cooperative sector. Um, as far as I know, it makes up around 2% of the entire economy. So the economy is still dominated by public and private sector, but it's not because of the lack of desire by the movement, clearly the intent is there. It's really about the challenges that they have faced and there are plenty of external challenges. We can talk about that you know, when we talk about international solidarity, but there are also internal challenges. It's really hard to convince people that a cooperative is a good idea. Um, you know, most of the people are just not familiar with this concept. They don't trust that it's going to be more secure for them in terms of you know, income, source of income compared to regular employment. Um, and so it takes a lot of convincing. It's also, you know, the, the movement is doing something new, right? This is the first time that they really had the opportunity to try out their philosophy and practice. So in many aspects of the revolution it has been a trial and error process, including um, in their effort to form cooperatives. So some cooperatives, some cooperatives have failed <laughs> and you know they're pretty open about this if you talk to the organizers uh, um, on this front you know and fail like for some obvious reasons uh, for example you know some some groups of individuals will come and get apply to get the land to form a cooperative and then get the land and hire other people to work the land and not work themselves and so the movement then realizes oh we didn't think about this right we should have made a caveat or some sort of requirement that you know, if, if you want to profit um, from this cover, we also have to work, um, you know, in the equal um, amount as others do. And so, of course, the war conditions, there's an economic crisis generally in Syria, but it has been compounded for Northeast Syria by the de facto embargo imposed by Turkey. So that has made it more difficult for the autonomous administration, you know, to develop their economic projects. And so I think, you know, when we talk about the unions, we really have to situate them in this larger project. So really, I think as far as I understand the union organizing, um, the aim is, you know, sort of the longer um, aim beyond you know, making sure the workers are treated fairly is to actually show them that they can organize themselves, that they can, um, you know, there's a um, um, sort of effort to encourage workers to um, set up like um, self-managed projects of various sorts. So like to, to develop the skills, to, to realize that they can manage things by themselves so that eventually the cooperative sector can grow. Thank you very much. So I think you actually bring, um, bringing up all the cooperative efforts there, I think is a good place to begin because you know, as far as I understand it, co-ops used to really be sister organizations to the union movements or the labor struggles, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And I feel like today, at least my impression is, is that uh, cooperatives are thought of less as part of the labor struggle and more as just an alternative form of business, at least in the United States. And uh, at least hearing the way that a lot of people talk about them, that's my impression. But uh, when what we see in the United Kingdom is that the Labor Party there actually has a subdivision, which is called the Cooperative Party. And they have ongoing efforts to increase cooperative um, production and 
consumer cooperatives and all sorts of cooperatives in the United Kingdom. And then in the United States, actually, we were just able to get uh, what used to be called the Work Act into a spending bill that passed, which is eventually going to uh, um, give private or start public funding to a network of organizations to promote workers' self-ownership as well as um, help out unions to who might have the opportunity to, to buy the company from the owners if the owners are planning to close it and things like that. And so let's, let's start there and get a picture of what the cooperative and the union movement relationship is like um, in the United States or in France, which I know it's been very important as well. And uh, yeah, whoever wants to go first, I know Renee, you've written about this a lot. And David, I know you're familiar with this too. So, Well, if, if you stick to anarchist orthodoxy, if I, if I may say so, uh, the, the Proudhon and Bakunin were not opposed to the principle of um, organizing cooperatives. They only said that it was not uh, possible to change society with with cooperatives only but it was a good good way for workers to learn how to organize things but uh, they, they they were not in favor of cooperatives if you mean by that you can over you can uh, you, you can change society and create a, a a socialist society just with cooperatives and bakunin said something also interesting cooperatives uh, are possible in uh, peripheral uh, 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 sectors of uh, uh, of industry. You can't you, you can't make a, a steel works with a, co uh, uh, with a cooperative. You, you need enormous amounts of capital, and only big capital can invest in this sort of uh, uh, these this sort of industry. So cooperatives can only uh, be possible. In 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 small uh, uh, industry, small workshops, and uh, small commerce and uh, trade, and, and 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 so on. So, but what I what I hear about Rujava looks, however, very much like Proudhonism in 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 many ways. I would say, and uh, I, I recognize many things Proudhon said in in what uh, in in what Anna explained. And uh, well, it's very extremely interesting. Uh, another thing which st struck me is that obviously it's uh, a system, uh, an experimental si system. They they don't they don't start things with uh, 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 ideology in mind. They start things with experimental uh, uh, d different different solutions to their to the problems they have to face. And that, that seems very interesting to me also. Uh, well, there's something I'd like to ask Anna. Where, where do uh, the, 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 the fighters in Rojava get their weapons? Um, well, <laughs> that's uh, where the largest bulk of the income um, that uh, the administration is able to generate um, goes to because of the ongoing um, effort to fight Turkey. Turkey has been attacking and um, ISIS has not been defeated fully. So, in fact, you know, a big chunk of the economy of the production goes to you know, make sure the military is standing and um, the military efforts continue. And uh, I think a lot of people know that um, the administration has been receiving some sort of um, you know, limited assistance from the United States, um, in particular aerial assistance during the fight of ISIS. Um, that they, you know, which was a um, life or death issue, they would not have been able to defeat ISIS without that type of assistance. They do not have their own aircraft, clearly, or aircraft defense systems, so they do not have access to any advanced 
type of weaponry because they're not a state. And this lack of diplomatic, lack of international status has affected them in many ways, including in terms of what kind of weaponry they have access to. Mm -hmm. If I may jump in, I think that what history bears out, and this is no different in Rojava today, um, whenever we see a revolution, uprising, um, a movement, in my view, that, that challenges found at a foundational level uh, the status quo of the economic order, then inevitably that revolution will face massive external challenges because it represents a threat. So I do not think it is any mistake that once the revolution largely, not completely, but largely drove ISIS out of its territory, established autonomous control over its regions, and began to build or an experiment with alternative uh, models, directly democratic models of self-governing, uh, it shouldn't be shocking that uh, a NATO country, in this case, Turkey, uh, would first invade the northern part of this nation or this, this region, occupy large swaths of the north, while uh, to carrying out waves at different times, waves of, of bombardments and attacks, uh, be it through artillery or through aircraft or drones, on the infrastructure. Turkey very much sees this as a threat to their internal stability, because if the Rojava, directly democratic Rojava model can take hold in Syria, the fear is, from uh, the right-wing Turkish government point of view, is that that will serve as a model for the traditional areas of Kurdistan, which is a large minority population within Turkey. So we saw in 1917 in Russia, massive international pressure on the revolution uh, after it came to power. We've seen uh, when workers rose up in Spain to defend themselves against the fascist coup, that the Western countries in those cases uh, turned their back on the fight. Uh, with, I think, the exception of Mexico and Russia, uh, the major Western countries did not supply arms, refused to supply arms, while fascist Germany and Italy were happy to uh, supply arms to Franco. Uh, if we look at Cuba, Cuba has faced nothing but challenges since coming the communist uh, and Castro came to power in 1959, be it through the U.S. blockade or what have you. These are all efforts. They, they are planned efforts to try to undermine the ability of these societies to carry forth the vision that propelled them to victory in, in their initial fight, in their initial fight to overthrow the established order. So the fact that this is happening today in Rojava should not be shocking. The question becomes, what do we do as an international working class to support them, to help them with that challenge, to not lose sight or not lose uh, the impetus to carry forth their vision? Uh, I don't pretend to have the answers to that, but I do know as a labor leader uh, here in the United States, in Vermont, that we do have a responsibility to express that, to express that solidarity. But I also want to say that the fact that that struggle continues, the fact that it's developing, uh, and, and other things that are going on across the world, including here in the United States, give me great hope and optimism. Now, I believe it was Jean-Paul Sartre, who said something uh, something along the lines of the reason why the worker doesn't rise up today to create uh, a working class revolution is because the worker cannot adequately imagine what a liberated world would be like. So part of what our job as international uh, labor, as the working class, as leaders need to be, is to give voice to those aspirations, to give voice to that vision, to create channels, democratic channels for workers to know that they could have views, opinions, collective interests, and that those organizations that they are part of can be the vehicle, can be a way for those visions to, to move forward. And it's by giving that kind of hope, by giving that kind of power that we're gonna begin to create the dynamics possible for serious foundational change uh, across the globe. Uh, it will be hard, but uh, I have zero doubt, zero, that in the end, uh, we will win. 
we are the 99% of the global of the globe's population working people their history history or the status quo is like a dam but that dam can't hold forever and as we build the pressure and as we build power that dam will break and the logical conclusion of of that breach is going to be a more free more democratic more socialist world but there's a long way, uh, way between now and then of course so it's already come up a couple times, uh, and it's two related topics. One is uh, participation in elections, right? And I know, David, you, you mentioned you know, how, uh, how that could be a distraction and things like that. And I know Renee was well, discussing – sorry? No, well, I think that the question of elections is complex. I'm sorry I interrupted. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the related the related topic is the topic of funding, which is it came up uh, when Anna was talking about you know the acquisition of uh, weapons and things necessary to continue to fight the Turkish state and some of its goons and whatever remains of ISIS. And uh, you know it also comes up when we talk talk about France and talk about the defensive position that uh, the struggle there is taking with healthcare and all sorts of other social goods that are being slowly stripped from the working class in France. And it seems to me like these two things are related in a pretty significant way. And um, uh, I wanted to open it up to a discussion a little bit about that. About uh, the role of electoral politics and, and, and how that has impact for better or worse? Uh, for better or worse, and in relation to funding and financial uh, strategy. Well, if, if you don't mind me taking a crack at at least part of this. Now, uh, there I know there are those who would prefer to uh, live in a theoretical world, a theoretical world where uh, something is either purely good or purely bad. But uh, the frankly, I'm not interested in that world. I'm interested in the world that we actually live in, where we actually struggle in. So uh, we can all say in the United States, for example, that the two major political parties, Democrats and Republicans, are capitalist parties, and, and therefore we should just turn our back on that and not worry about elections. But the fact is, elections do matter, and things do happen. Uh, there are causes and effects on elections. I think we need, I know we need, to take a pragmatic view of them. That does not mean that the labor movement should continue down its path of writing a blank check to the Democratic Party. Democratic Party has failed us time and time again for generations. But it also does not mean that we should ignore this important public struggle regarding what democratic rights we do have in a limited way in a representational democracy. Here in the Green Mountain State, we have three major political parties, which is very different from the rest of the, the country. Our third party, which is, is real, is the Vermont Progressive Party that are essentially democratic socialists. Our lieutenant governor comes from that party. The state auditor comes from that party. There's a caucus in the state house of both senators and state representatives that come from that party. So the Vermont AFL-CIO has consistently backed that slate since United came to power in 2019, something we've never done before. And we've endorsed uh, less Democrats. We used to endorse 100 in every general election and get nothing in return, even if they all won their elections, which close was close to the case. In the last general election, we did uh, make an exception for eight a total of eight Democrats that we endorse who are labor champions. But my point is, uh, I think it is wise for us to engage in elections, especially local elections, uh, but not to be chained to the capitalist parties when we do. But where we have won, say in the city of Burlington or the city of Barrie, local cities here in Vermont, and where we have managed to uh, help uh, Democratic Socialist Party, the progressives, win a majority of those city councils. In both cases, different election years, that same year or the next year, we were able to pass responsible contractor ordinances that require prevailing wages for construction workers when uh, significant uh, public money is used in public construction projects. That is a direct cause and effect between 
getting uh, socialists elected uh, at the local level and then seeing legislation that economically benefits our members. And the more we build our unions, of course, uh, the more resources we're going to have for organizing because that is more per capita dues. And as long as that money's not being sunk into bad candidates, bad elections and ineffective lobbying and is actually being sent into organizing, then it has a, an effect of building upon itself. So I think elections are important. They need to be engaged in, but they you need to be smart about it. And one should not just uh, go the old failed route of getting behind the Democrats just because they're not Republicans. Uh, Renee, did you want to take a crack at that as well? Well, I, I don't quite agree with what David said. Well, I, I understand very well. Uh, what he means, I mean, but uh, on the long run, I, I, I think that, well, each time something has, has been won in, in favor of the working class, in, in France at least, it was not through elections, it was through a struggle. Uh, the the eight-hour day, the, the uh, the uh, two weeks paid holidays in 1936, and then uh, four weeks uh, paid holidays uh, 20 years later, and now uh, f five weeks paid holidays today. All that was won through struggle, and uh, these these acquisitions—I don't know how the word the uh, acquisitions of the working class were legalized by the parliament. That, that's true, but. Uh, the healthcare system, uh, uh, everything positive we have, yeah. was something which resulted in in some sometimes very harsh struggle. The eight-hour day was uh, was given to was uh, acquired after uh, uh, one thousand workers died in in a mine in a coal mine in the north of France, and there was a, 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 a strike. Uh, in 1906, there was a general strike in France for the eight-hour for the eight-hour day, uh, which wasn't won at once, but which uh, started a process which led to the eight-hour day. So uh, I don't say, I don't mean that relying on the parliament on, on the elections is useless, but. The, the 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 most important job is done by the struggles. I, I think. I, I couldn't agree with the, you more. The, the the problem the problem is. Well, I, I often have been tempted to believe that uh, uh, local local democracy, for instance, uh, could be a very good thing. But the problem is. Historically, the, the, uh, all the socialist parties who said we go in for elections, but it's only to count our votes. Uh, it's only uh, temporary. It never is temporary. <laughs> they, 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 they stick their hand in the, in the in the mechanic, and after it's the, it's 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 the, the arm and all the body which comes through it. So, it's uh, in my mind, it's it's very dangerous. And you can't only rely on asking people to be cautious, uh, because you can't be cautious in when you uh, stick in when you start doing something which whose logics uh, leads you to be overwhelmed by the system. I don't know if I, I I'm, I'm clear. I, I think you've made some excellent points, uh, and I I agree with you. The but without. Without great risk, there is no great gain. Uh, without experimentation, we're not going to find anything new. Uh, I do not mean to suggest that because I, I firmly believe that it is important for the labor movement to engage in electoral politics in the limited scope uh, on a tactical level uh, in places where, where that possibility uh, is present. I don't mean to suggest that the gains will be done at the voting booth and by electing a majority of any party. But uh, the real power, no matter which party is in power, is going to be in the streets, in the factories, in the actions we take, in our ability to strike, in our ability to have solidarity. Absolutely. 
but I would rather have a, a party in a majority status or a strong minority status uh, that at least uh, gives lip, lip service, if nothing else, but it, that discusses or is aware of the, uh, the issues of the working class as opposed to a, uh, the increasingly, for example, neo-fascist Republican Party uh, here in the United States. But people forget the greatest gains made by the American working class were during the Great Depression, uh, the New Deal under FDR. But that did not just happen because FDR waved a magic wand and said, let it be so. There were millions, millions of workers in the streets. There were strike actions on unprecedented levels going on all across this country. So the real core of our power will never be in elections, will never be uh, made in a voting booth. It will always be in our solidarity and in our labor. I'm with you 100% on that. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to give Anna a chance to speak on this because uh, you mentioned that, you know, there is a relationship between the union uh, efforts in Rojava and uh, what might be thought of as political parties or the the democratic uh, government there. And, you know, in different contexts, we see, you know, the context really does have a lot of uh, impact on the ability for workers or anyone in their communities to have power and to make their own decisions. I wanted to, you know, hear what your take on this is, you know, given that it's so different there. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, as I mentioned, right, it's all trial and error process. They have um, changed, transformed the political system several times since they set it up, um, trying to troubleshoot and see how all these different um, sectors of the society, different forms of organization come together. And, you know, the reason why they still have a more conventional, traditional political parties is um, that for a lot of people, this is what politics looks like, right? So as I mentioned, like no, the society is much more conservative than the revolutionary movement. And so they sort of have to meet the society midway, right? They you know, meet the, the people where they are and uh, hence um, they have not you know, abandoned the form of a political party. Um, and they you know, have preserved, they have uh, allowed space for political parties to participate in the political system alongside with the directly democratic element, uh, right, which uh, comprises communes, cooperatives, alongside with empowered civil society structures, which includes um, trade unions. And so the philosophy is to empower civil society in all um, types of uh, um, ways in order um, for the people to be represented um, you know, as powerfully as possible. It doesn't work ideally at the moment, you know, precisely because they're still trying to figure out how these different elements can come together and not be in the conflict and for different elements not be, not have more power than other elements. And, you know, for example, when I went there and talked to local organizers, to movement members, you know, I've heard, I heard a lot of criticism that um, despite sort of administrative changes, despite setting up communes, um, um, you know, formally, substantively, the movement has not achieved uh, the same, uh, the level of participation locally through the communes as they would like to see and as would required, as would be required in order for communes to be really uh, representative of people's power. So it's, you know, it's still a you know, process in progress and they're trying to figure out how to make it work. So let's talk a little bit more about the international side of things, because in the past, you know, one of the most powerful and you could almost say the the real beginnings of revolutionary socialist uh, activity in Europe and elsewhere was the first International Working Men's Association. And we've seen several attempts, you know, since that time to form internationals, whether you're talking about the Communist Party internationals or you're talking about specifically anarchist internationals or whatever else. And it makes me ask the question of what the structure of our international efforts looks like or now or could look like and where we 
where we see this uh, uh, next step being taken. So, for instance, uh, is the AFL CIO or the CGT, or is there an international, you know, formally that is uh, a venue for any kind of international organizing, or is it more peer to peer? Uh, Renee, would you like to take it, or would you like uh, me to? Well, I, I can't. I can't speak on behalf of the CGT. I, I'm just uh, a, a, a simple. Uh, 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 ex-militant because I'm retired and I used to have responsibilities in my union which is only a small fraction of, of the CGT but uh, I, I, I can't speak on behalf of the CGT uh, such as it is today which is, which is uh, quite reformist I would say uh, it's uh, a bit more radical than the other uh, big union, big confederations in France but hardly so uh, that, that's all I don't know what their their international policy is. Uh, I can perhaps say a few words about the the anarchist movement, uh, which is something much more limited <laughs> than the CGT. Because, but the, the, the presently, uh, I, I, well, in in France, there has uh, it's complicated. <laughs> uh, after the first world, the second world war. There would have been a possibility for the CNT to constitute as the hire of a former organization which existed before the war, the world, I mean, World War II, which was called CGT SR, CGT Syndicaliste Revolutionnaire. And uh, they reconstituted this uh, CGT SR, changed its name in CNT by imitation for the uh, Spanish CNT, but which had nothing to do with it. The problem is, it was at that time in 1945-48, uh, under the control of the most radical members of of the of the Spanish CNT and the FAI. And their position was that to be uh, a member of uh, the union, which was reconstituted, you had to be an anarchist which was absolutely stupid. Uh, at that time, many, many workers, many union members in France were fed up with the Communist Party and wanted to leave the CGT. And uh, whole unions went to see the CNT, which was being re reconstructed, I would say. And the people in charge of the CNT would say, are you anarchists? And they said, no. So you can't join the, you can't, you, we, we can't accept you. So the CNT remains something very small and very, uh, very uh, radical and uh, very sectarian for, for, for 20 or 30 years. In the meantime, all the people who left the CGT, whole unions left the CGT, I mean, thousands of people, they formed uh, another union, uh, another confederation called so I think the CNT missed a very, very important point by, by this sectarianism. And this sectarianism remained until recently. And uh, one of the present day forms of the CNT uh, are the representatives of this, uh, this uh, uh, form of CNT in 1946, 47, you see? They represent the same ideology uh, of uh, 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 the, the the members of an of an anarcho syndicalist union must be anarchists, which is counterproductive in my opinion. So uh, they, they formed an international which doesn't represent much. I mean, it's, it's, it's not even. I don't even think it's worth mentioning. And other attempts were made. But since the starting point was really small, they never, in my, I don't think they never reached anything uh, uh, really uh, important. W what exists today is a, a form of international which has been created not by the by, by, not by the Alaku syndicates, but by the radical uh, militants 
of the traditional unions, which formed uh, a, a, a small confederation in which are many anarchists uh, and, and, uh, and quite a number of Trotskyists. And this organization is creating links with other radical minority organizations in other countries. I don't know if uh, Dave uh, has heard about it. And uh, so they, they formed a, a sort of coordination. I wouldn't say, uh, uh, strictly speaking, a workers' international, but an international coordination of radical minority unions throughout industrialized countries. But it's it's only an attempt. I don't know. I don't think it represents something really significant uh, in case of an international struggle today. If, uh, there had to be one. So, I mean, what comes to mind when you ask the question of uh, international and the labor movement? There are right. There are large uh, international labor organizations. The, the ILO, International Labor Organization, being one. There are uh, major unions, major union international uh, communication. But uh, frankly, uh, at this stage in history, they're meaningless. Uh, Anya, uh, I know we'll be able to speak more to this, but there was a very direct call for international solidarity and labor to labor organizations uh, dialogue between the Kurdish unions in Rojava and uh, the union, the labor movement in the United States and other parts of the world. And frankly, it's been challenging. Uh, I think Anya could speak more to it, but it's been challenging to develop those dialogues. Uh, we were pleased that the Vermont AFL-CIO heeded that call and was happy to open a formal dialogue. Uh, the Vermont AFL-CIO was also pleased in 2001 to recognize uh, the autonomous government of Rojava and, and stated support for the revolution. But the problem with creating a meaningful, not a minority, not a small, not an isolated, not a sectarian international body, but the problem with creating a meaningful, real, mass-driven international labor organization or coordinate international movements is that first we need to uh, take care of our own house. Meaning this, if workers in the United States, less so in Vermont, but in other states, if they already don't feel a sense of ownership and identity with the larger labor body, the AFL-CIO, then they are not going to, even the best case scenario, where let's just pretend for a moment the Vermont, uh, that the national AFL-CIO in a meaningful way was building international relationships, the rank and file worker on the shock, uh, factory floor, the construction worker, the nurse, are not going to feel any connection whatsoever to that next level organization that is international in, in perspective. Uh, I would contend that we do need to pay attention. We do need to form these international relationships. But the more pressing issue in, in, in much of the world is to first reform, <coughs> change, radically change uh, the structures within our own national labor organizations to make them more connected and meaningful with rank and file. And once we do that, I think we'll be a better positioned to more meaningfully, uh, in a more formalized way, build the international network that we will need to eventually overthrow, to change, to transform, to do away with abolish capitalism. Uh, but that is a, that's a long project. Unfortunately, much of the United States uh, international unionism, uh, if you go back some decades, has been to support the official leadership, not the rank and file, of course, but to support reactionary regimes around the world uh, working in tandem with some very dubious forces. Uh, but that begins to change when you change the makeup and the structure and the leadership of the inter of the unions that compose the U.S. labor movement. Like today, for example, uh, the United Auto Workers, under the progressive leadership of, of their, their new um, president, Sean Fain, uh, has begun to engage with Mexican trade unions uh, to help develop uh, know-how and resources to better organize the, in an autonomous way, in a worker's way, uh, the auto industry in Mexico. That could be a very positive thing for the international labor movement, especially in North America. But if you had the wrong leadership decades ago doing the same thing, I could almost guarantee that that would be done for dubious reasons that perhaps would benefit mm -hmm. the cause of the international capitalists as opposed to the workers. So in short, 
I, I know we need to transform our own leadership. We need to transform our own national labor unions in order to get to the place where we can better coordinate and build a mass movement of millions and millions, hundreds of million workers uh, across the globe. But that's something we have to do. Yeah, as David said, it has been super challenging for us to gain any support in the U.S. labor. I mean, really, Vermont FLCO has been an exception. And, you know, for all kinds of reasons, I think that David went into. But what we are trying to, um, the point that we are trying to hammer through, um, you know, to the people in the U.S. the U.S. labor um, organizations is that it's not just, we are not just asking people to support Americans to support this project of hope, right? This potential alternative um, to enable its survival. We actually ask them to oppose their own government's complicity in Turkey's war on this region. And that's the main ask uh, that we'd like to emphasize because Turkey has been a very important NATO member. It's NATO's second largest army that has been able to get away with the war crimes and terrific human rights violations um, under the U.S. watch because the United States needs such a, you know, even though it's not the reliable uh, LA anymore, the United States needs Turkey. And Turkey has been very good at leveraging its position as a NATO member. I don't know if people have been following the um, recent uh, developments with um, Sweden and Finland entering NATO. Turkey blocked um, as a NATO member, um, it blocked uh, the application and they only lifted their objection quite recently um, in as a trade-off to get more fighter jets from the United States. Um, more than $20 billion worth of fighter jets that we know they have used against civilians and the civilian infrastructure in Northeast Syria and we know they will continue to use them because the United States doesn't say a word, even though they continue um, supporting um, the autonomous administration in a very limited way, you know, by um, keeping a very limited amount of troops there and supporting them specifically in their continuous anti-ISIS um, efforts, uh, but nothing else, right? They have um, allowed two major invasions and occupations. The United States has allowed um, the new two occupations by Turkey in 2018, 2019, the occupation is still ongoing. Um, it's people say it's the rule um, by Turkish gangs is comparable to ISIS, it's worse than ISIS and uh, the international community doesn't say a word. And so, you know, we feel that you know, as emergency committee for Rojava, as the US based um, network, you know, we, we try to bring this point home to, to Americans that they do bear some responsibility in terms of the actions of their own government and how that impacts uh, people's lives in the Middle East. So that is the last uh, thing I wanted us to discuss is the way that uh, organizing internationally in one way or another is, you know, hopefully a way to uh, to have an impact on nationalist wars uh, whether it's in Israel, Palestine right now, or Turkey and Rojava, or wherever else that we, you know, there is a very popular and urgent desire for these things to end. And yet, uh, we often find ourselves without the capacity to do much, even in the sense of boycott, divest, uh, and sanction. We find that our interests aren't represented in politics, uh, and that a lot of these situations are mostly out of our hands. Um, so, you know, in the past, labor organizing has been very important uh, uh, when it comes to uh, demilitarization or um, uh, just not joining the draft, having support for people who are re war resistors or resistant to their government's efforts. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, this is something that uh, is, you know, on top and center of their mind right now. And uh, how, you know, I wanted to have everyone talk a little bit about that and specifically. I mean, here in the United States, we've seen some major developments uh, since October, since the terrible 
horrible uh, activities of the, the right wing Israeli government uh, ethnically cleansing the large uh, parts of Gaza. Uh, we've seen tens of thousands of civilians murdered at the hands of the Israeli military. And it's taken some time. But now we see the postal workers, APWU, under progressive president Mark Dimenstein. We see um, the UAW under progressive leadership of Sean Fain. We see the United Electrical Workers. We see unions all across the country now uh, calling for a ceasefire and a just peace uh, in that part of the world. Uh, the national AFL-CIO it took them a while, but even they came out publicly a couple of weeks ago uh, in support of a ceasefire. Uh, we see with that struggle a growing movement of working people and labor organizations uh, becoming engaged in the anti-war effort uh, to pressure our government to begin to not be complicit in what amounts to ethnic cleansing. Uh, that's a positive development, but we need to go much further. and. Uh, as was being discussed uh, regarding France before, the notion of being on the offensive versus the defensive. I mean, obviously, we have a moral and political responsibility to be vocal and active against the slaughter going on in Gaza uh, right now. But we need to go on the offensive, too, and learn how to uh, make our unions more vocal and more supportive and more in solidarity with progressive revolutions like we see in Rojava, to not just... Uh, defend uh, people and workers against slaughter, but also to support workers when they rise up and demand more. This is a long project. Um, it will be hard. Everything we do is hard because it goes against the grain of the established world order in, in capitalism. Uh, but we are engaged. Uh, we will continue to engage. And I see that the, the movement towards a truly working class left I see that as gaining steam and gaining strength and power across the United States and in other parts of the world. So again, I'm, I'm optimistic. Well, concerning, concerning the situation in, uh, in the Gaza Strip and uh, the Near East, uh, generally speaking, I, I'm not very optimistic. Uh, I've been involved in uh, well, I've been interested in the Palestinian question for more than 30 years, si since the the, uh, the the Gulf War in 1990, 91. Because I I, I I had a broadcast on Radio Libertaire, the the, the radio of the, the Anarchist Federation, and uh, uh, at that time we had a we had a. a daily broadcast on the situation during the war and, and then I, I was responsible for a, for a weekly broadcast and uh, this is where I got interested in the Palestinian question because I interviewed a great great lot of people from the Near East and Northern Africa and, and uh, the Balkans and etc and uh, uh, eventually we some of my friends and myself formed a uh, an association in support for the Palestinian the justice and peace in Palestine. Palestine. And I, I finally, after years, I realized that the Palestinians would never have a state because uh, they are so divided. I mean, uh, Arafat was not General Jap. Uh, far from that. And that they were so divided that they would never be able to organize a, 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 a credible strategy for for liberation. When when you analyze the the, uh, the discussions, uh, Oslo and so on, you realize that the, the Palestinian leadership gave up everything with no compensation. They gave up terrorism. Uh, they gave, they recognized Israel and different other things, but they never demanded anything in return. Uh, so it's it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of strategy. Now, the the West Bank is occupied by seven hundred thousand uh, 
uh, uh, Jewish colonizers, colonizers, I don't know how you say it, and if you, if you, the, the, the possibility of a, a, a Palestinian state in the West Bank is absolutely absurd because that would mean expelling 700,000 people which ha had taken root in that territory which legally belongs to the Palestinians. So the two-state the, the, the two possibility, the two-state solution actually is practically impossible. So it's impossible to imagine a two-state solution. So, well, this is just a, 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 an assumption I'm, make, I'm making. The, the day the Palestinians will give up the idea of having a Palestinian state, what will they do? They will demand citizenship in Israel. And the day that happens, it's the end of Israel, such as the Israeli uh, leaders imagine it today. And it's not just an idea I have like that. There are uh, well-known Israeli leaders who said the same thing, including uh, a guy called uh, Ehud Olmert, who was, I think he was prime minister. He said, given the situation of the... Uh, uh, colonization, the Jewish colonization of, of, uh, of the West Bank, such as it is, it's impossible to create a Palestinian state. So what's the solution? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know how, how it will end up. Now, in France, the situation is very confused because we have the most stupid left parties in the world, I think. And uh, they... Either they were, they, they, they uh, how could I say? There's one one left party who refused to to uh, to uh, designate Hamas as terrorist. So he, they were so clumsy <clears throat> that the media had no difficulty in saying that they were pro Hamas, which wasn't was not the case, but. Now this party is is a finished. I mean, <laughs> uh, they, they they have no they have lost all uh, all credibility, and the other left wing parties uh, did the contrary. They supported uh, the Israeli government against Hamas. So uh, the, uh, the uh, in my opinion, the only ones who had a correct position were the anarchists, because they refused to. Consider Hamas as a liberating as a liberation organization. They said you can't consider as an organization of liberation for the people uh, if it is a religious organization. And I think that was the position that the most correct position possible in this case. And then uh, just to to wrap things up, Anna, I know. There have been some articles that have come out. Uh, I think Jacobin, there was an article specifically uh, someone wrote regarding the Israel-Palestine situation from the perspective of Rojava and things like that. And I was wondering what what's happening with that effort between groups in Rojava and, you know, people that are trying to end this occupation and war and Israel Palestine. Yeah, um, yeah, there's like historical links between the Kurdish freedom movement that emerged uh, within Turkey and that's then spread to Syria between them and the Palestinian resistance going back to the 70s. In fact, they used to train together um, at some point, and that resistance has continued in other forms, right? The um, Kurdish resistance movement is not just its. Um, it's not, not just Rojava, it's not just um, the PKK, the um, armed structure. There's been a um, show of solidarity through the civil wing of the movement. And I, I know, you know, we're not in a position to really tell the Palestinian, you know, people, to the Palestinian resistance uh, groups what strategy to take, right? Or, you know, what kind of vision to pursue, but we do... 
um, like to point out that, um, you know, when everything feels so hopeless and when we feel like, well, it's just so complicated, things are so difficult, uh, what kind of solution can be there? Um, I think Rojava does provide um, some sort of um, hope, at least, that it is possible to figure things out. And Abdullah Ojalan, the Kurdish movement's leader, when he wrote his you know, philosophy of democratic confederalism, um, he was thinking about Israel-Palestine um, as sort of this epitome of what went wrong in the Middle East, um, where different groups, I mean, it's such a um, mosaic of different peoples where they used to live in peace, right? But they used to share land and share uh, culture and share, um, you know, be part of sim um, same governing structures. And um, so clearly, um, Ojalan explicitly did think about the uh, paradigm of democratic confederalism as a solution, not just for the like Jewish people who have been internally colonized, right? There's not much total settler colonialism in Kurdistan, but uh, Kurdistan as a whole has been um, an internal colony, sort of divided between four nation states, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. And so he envisioned this paradigm to be a solution, not just for Kurdistan, but um, for other peoples in the Middle East, you know, whose lands were um, artificially divided, right? Whose uh, um, uh, and, and put um, under control of uh, different other, other groups, right? Other um, groups and uh, authoritarian nation states. So um, yeah, for sure, um, it's, a, it's a ray of hope. But, um, it's a, an alternative to the nation state model that they're developing explicitly in uh, Rojava. And uh, we can see in practice, it's a challenging effort. Um, there are longstanding hostilities between different groups. Not everyone is on board <laughs> with this project. You know, it's very easy um, to go to go there and realize that people are pretty open, the ones uh, who oppose the project. Um, but it's, you know, it's a process. It's a genuine effort to bring different groups that used to fight each other, used to massacre each other to the same uh, table and find a middle ground. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming on today and taking your time. Uh, we're almost at two hours. And I mean, you know, it's getting people from three different countries to come together and have this conversation, I think, is really important. And I wish that it could be bigger and these conversations could be happening more often with people from all over the world. But, you know, I'm trying to do my part. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I would love to have each of you on again for anything else wanting you to talk about and appreciate you coming on. Solidarity. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much.